Hey guys, this is Clay. Welcome back. Today I have Lexi with me and I thought she could join me for this topic. Some people have noticed that I have been really terrible at making videos lately. I've probably only made a few in the last five or six months. One of the main reasons for that is my main employee for my business left to start her own business. And as a result, I've just had way more work to do. And then I think the longer it's been since I've made a video, the more stressed out it makes me. And I almost feel like I have to do something big and amazing because it's been so long. So then it's almost like I just don't do anything. So we were having a conversation recently where I'm not sure how it started, but I think it may have started because I noticed that in my life, if you look back in the past, many of my friendships, are, they're almost the same type of person. And I started to wonder, why am I always friends with this very specific type of person? Um, specifically, INTJ personalities. It seems like I'm always friends with them. Um, so if you don't know what that is, um, Myers-Briggs personality types. There's 16 types. We are both INFJs, one of the 16 types. And then the INTJ is another one. And it's, it's a very like rational type. They don't express a lot of feelings, but are very rational, and they seem to really separate and throw out the emotional considerations a lot of times and just look at things really rationally. And so I've, I've been wondering if there's something about that that really just attracts me. So as we were talking about this, we also noticed Alexi's friends are a similar thing, but not that rational INTJ kind of personality for friendships is more like the ENFPs, which is they're very expressive and more, you know, idea machines. It seems like that's one thing about ENFPs. They just have so many ideas and they're very emotional and they, they express themselves really well. You can often see an ENFP just by the way they dress. So it seems like a lot of your people end up being ENFPs. Yeah, I mean, I think that it's not even just friends, it's just people who I look up to or aspire to be, um, other photographers that I'm interested in or musical artists. My therapist even is probably an ENFP. I think I just naturally gravitate towards that kind of profiling. I would say not even just ENFPs, INFPs as well, and probably ENFJs would be in the same boat of people that I feel more of a magnetic pull to. There's something else I've noticed over my life is that I have a lot of avoidant people. So if you go back to attachment styles, I did a video on attachment styles, you know, secure attachment, anxious attachment, uh, avoidant. So people that are avoidant often keep a lot of things inside. They don't share very much. It's very hard to get them to open up. They're avoidant. They avoid things. Why am I gravitated? towards them and not, you know, people that might be a little more open and expressive. Because at the end of the day, what do I really like in a relationship is I like people who are able to open up and we can have good conversations. The thing about INTJs is I think maybe that's what I, I, I enjoy about them is that they're so, you can have really good intellectual conversations, but I think it, it often ends there. There's not a lot of like emotional discussion very much. And I would, I think I'd like that out of my friendships a little more, maybe. I think that's one thing about our relationship is that there is quite a bit of that. And that's why I think I find this relationship quite fulfilling. So anyway, we were talking about why we might, you know, pick the friends that we pick. Because it does seem like I seem to have a type and she has a completely different type. Yeah, I guess it all kind of, for me, started with a discussion with my therapist um, about the people that we tend to gravitate towards and why we gravitate towards them. Um, and she was talking about how a lot of people look at projection as just a negative thing, how you're looking at, you have negative things in yourself and some people project those onto others in their life, but you can also do that for positive things. So there could be a thing inside of you that you see mirrored in somebody else. Um, and you are attracted to that and maybe develop relationships based on that or develop your mentors based on that. And I kind of really liked the 
concept and when I really started delving into the people that I find the shiniest, um, there are things within them that I like for maybe almost selfish reasons because those are areas in my life that I want to develop better and I can see it so clearly in them and I want to almost emulate that in my own life. So what, like what kind of things in this case? I think like ENFPs in particular, they have such strong authenticity and that's something that I really find important and I want to be authentic I want the self-expression that they have, and I maybe struggle to put myself out there to the same degree that they do. Like my best friend's an ENFP, and she'll literally just walk out of the house in like a bright floral red muumu, and like won't even think twice about it. And I would struggle to wear something so loud in public, even if I wanted to. Um, and I think even furthermore, like in my own work as a photographer, people who really seem to step outside of the cultural box and really go for it um, and express themselves on their own terms rather than always trying to almost people please society and follow trends. And I just think those people are the most inspirational for me and people that I'm definitely most attracted to. So yeah, I think with my upbringing, I was raised with fairly emotional, like overreactive emotions, I think in a lot, of, a lot of cases, and there wasn't a lot of rationality. So it's possible that maybe I just gravitated towards rational people, but I think I was almost attracted to people with very, you know, even emotions, or even like no emotions, or no, the type of people that would not have an emotional outburst at all. Non-reactive. Yeah, like non-reactive. Tell you people you could say things to and they're just, they're not going to freak out, right? I think in, in my house growing up, you know, you could say the wrong things and it would cause big problems. You know, my best friend growing up, INTJ, you know, at the time, I wonder if it was just a really healthy thing for me to have this very stable, low emotion person in my life. As I grew older, I began to realize that there, it's almost like a lack of emotional intelligence there as well, which had its own problems. But with the household I grew up in, which was very overreactive emotionally, and there wasn't a lot of rationality, uh, very unpredictable at times, um, with that, you know, I found this friend, this best friend who was kind of the opposite of that. And then, you know, as I grew up, I eventually, I got married very young. And I've talked a little bit about that as well. I don't think it was really the best situation for me. But another person that was very avoidant, very low emotions, just somebody that was stable. Anyway, I think that's sort of part of growing up and that's the thing, right? You make these decisions when you're younger and then as you grow older, you become a more solid person. And then as I grew older, I think I started to need more of that again. So anyway, I've made a new friend recently and lo and behold, another INTJ. And I really like ENFPs and their authenticity and their expression. However, I find that they're always very spiritual. I'm not sure if that's just a generalization, but it seems like all ENFPs, have very elaborate religious ideas, or religious or spiritual. You know, even if they're not part of a religion, they seem quite spiritual. Like, and I, you know, I, we met this ENFP recently, and you know, she's an astrologer. And that sort of fits the whole, the whole profile. But there's something ar around the lack of rationality in many of these spiritual beliefs that kind of I don't really know what it is. It almost scares me. It scares me away. So as soon as somebody starts throwing out very unsubstantiated spiritual claims, I don't know. It kind yeah, of I freaks know. me out. I feel like I grew up in a very structured household, and I think the unstructured nature of them is what I find attractive. They're flighty but I don't even mean it in a mean way it's just like they run with their spirit and it's not like anything else holds them back maybe the same way that a lot of us are held back 
culturally or socially, they just seem to literally march to the beat of their own drum. And I think that's something that I really wish I had more of. I feel like I was forced into a lot more cultural norms when I was younger than I maybe would subscribe to today. And I think that ENFPs really represent kind of breaking down a lot of those social norms and cultural expectations and they just do whatever they want and think whatever they want and wear whatever they want and I think even though I might not always think it's rational or logical or maybe the best life decision I think I still respect that on-brand authenticity they seem to have with themselves which I think I between people pleasing and then my own desire for authenticity it just doesn't come out maybe the same way that theirs does. So in your upbringing, maybe you had lots of rationality. <laughs> definitely lots of, lots more rationality. <laughs> and logic and decisions were made definitely more with the brain than with the heart. So do you think it's possible that it's almost like you would seek the opposite? Like I'm just wondering if we, in the end, it's like we seek, we... Can we even control what we're looking for in people? Can we, can we control who we're attracted to? Or is it just deter determined for us, is what I'm wondering. Even more interestingly, I guess my therapist was talking about almost growing out sometimes of your attraction, especially with maybe fast friends. So you might have become, or you might have been attracted to them initially because they represent something in yourself that you want to grow or expand on, or something that is very shiny to you, and you kind of want that within yourself. And then once you have learned that skill, or have adopted that value, then you might find that relationship less passionate, um, and you can almost grow out of that attraction. And I think that happens a lot in younger relationships, friends as you grow up and as you're developing and even early romantic relationships, I think are frequently that way. Actually, one thing that attracted me to you in the very beginning was authenticity. And you seem to always have this sense of art and you would just push towards it. Kind of, even though maybe it kind of was a little bit, you know, outside the lines. And I always found that, I think I want that too. You see me pushing the lines a little and being a little more countercultural, and I see it as not even doing it enough. I still don't feel like I am completely authentic to the message that I really want to put out into the world. I explained it to you somebody the other day where I find like ENFPs are the square peg trying to fit into a round hole. And even if I started off as a square, I'll shave the edges off so I can fit into the round hole where the ENFP will maintain those edges no matter what. So the inside, I might still be authentic and what I display is still authentic, but it's a watered down version of what I'd really like to be. Yeah, I think that's one of the biggest struggles, especially of a people pleaser. And it's like this obsession with what everybody thinks of you, first of all. So it really depends on your community. So if you had, if you grew up in like a community of artists that were doing, you know, outside the box type art, then maybe it'd be quite easy to do that yourself. I grew up in a very, you know, strict Christian type thing and my entire community were Christians. I actually became a photographer quite young. I got my first SLR camera when I was like 13. I always loved taking pictures. And then as I got older, I started taking pictures of people. And a lot of the times I wanted to push the boundaries of what people thought I, I don't really know what it, I, don't, I, I have a hard time really knowing why I want to do certain things sometimes, but I guess the thing and one thing about Christianity is it's quite conservative when it comes to sexuality you know so if you start pushing the boundaries in those areas especially if you're married and you're like a man of the house and you're a husband and you're a father I mean it's really no different for mothers too though once you're a mother 
you know, you have, you're expected to behave in a certain way. And so I've always felt this like extreme pressure to, you know, do what these people want to see from me. And, but, you know, I also want to not do that. I want to do what's authentic to me. And it's always been this struggle for me anyway. I've, I've talked to quite a few INFJs out there and it seems like this is a common struggle for that personality it's like this you want to be authentic but you're just also just people pleasing as well and you have a hard time remain authentic and you can almost go into situations and you can kind of become what you know other people want from you <clears throat> so it could be that this desire you have it's just trying to get away from that I think it really depends on your community I mean I went to university and minored in fine arts and there's really not much you can do to freak out art kids <laughs> and that's when I started um, nude modeling for art classes and for photography workshops and stuff like that and I think that's when I started to kind of bloom a little bit more in the area that I found interesting and then I also got into a relationship young and married young and it kind of dampened that and pulled me back down into what is culturally expected of me and what would appease my relationships at that time. And then I slowly like creeped back up and slowly became again what I wanted to be and who I wanted to be and the message that I wanted to kind of put out with my art came back in later in life. All right, so getting back on topic here, <laughs> we have a tendency to go off topic all the time. Um, it was a study I came across and just to give people credit here, it was these two researchers, Carolyn Wise and Lisa F. Wood at the University of Puget Sound in Tacoma, Washington. Um, so they did all these studies on really what creates friendships. And so a lot of it was what you would expect. Um, for example, you know, what makes a good friend? Closeness and contact, as well as as well as supportiveness. So obviously contact means you're, you know, in the same area or you see each other often. So, you know, that's why people become friends when they work together or they see each other at school or, you know, they do some kind of activity together. Um, and then combine that with closeness and some support and you can sort of build up this intimacy, like an emotional intimacy. So those three characteristics, in their opinion, predicted when people would become friends. But one thing that I thought was kind of interesting um, was the criteria for a best friend. And they said almost exclusively the thing that predicted a best friend over just a regular friend was social identity support. So somebody who supports your identity. And I thought this was interesting because it almost sounds a little selfish. Like, I guess I don't really like the thought that this person's my best friend because they support my identity. But, but I, I mean, alternatively, you have to think that means that you also support their identity for them to be best friends back. So it's more of a mirroring, I would say, than necessarily a selfishness. Yeah, so I guess this is sort of going back to what you said earlier. It is sort of some proof. It's, well, proof, or it's like a study that kind of supports that, that people generally will look for other people who can almost like bolster up this thing that they think is important. So what are some, like, what are some examples of that? Like, let's say you are a really good tennis player, and it's really important to you, and that's your identity. Like, I'm a good tennis player it's probably likely that you'll end up with another tennis friend who's your best friend, but that person will almost like prop you up and affirm the fact that you are a very good tennis player. So if, if your identity is, I'm a good tennis player, if this person comes along and says, you're a good tennis player, that's kind of what they're, they're saying. But this could be for anything, like it could be religious beliefs, sort of why, you know, the best relationships, it, it seems hard to me People who have very strong religious beliefs and they're drastically different, it seems unlikely to me that those people will be best friends. And it's something that I experienced as I grew up in Christianity and my whole community was that, and then I eventually left that. 
and I lost almost all of my friendships because I could no longer validate that in them. I could no longer validate their identities. So I thought this sort of was an explanation for that. Yeah, and I think sometimes you might feel like you have similar values or a similar perspective in life as somebody, and that can create the train towards friendship, but as the closeness comes in, you realize there's maybe more holes in that friendship than you originally thought, and that's where I think some friendships kind of dip down or become acquaintances, you know? Like, I could meet an art friend in art school and really feel compatible on that level, and we hang out, we talk about art, and then I find out that they don't support, I don't know, I don't want to say anything political, this is hard. (laughs) They don't support something that is very important to me, uh, and that might put a little rift in the friendship. And the more of those things that come up where our values differ, they're less and less likely to become a close friend in the long run. So what can we take away from this? I think one of the biggest things to note for me, I think I used to get really down on myself and start to overanalyze friendships that have drifted or fallen apart over time with no maybe big blowout, no real closure. I think that this might present itself as an explanation and that as your identities change and what you prioritize and find important changes, your interests, your perspective, your friendships are going to change too. And I don't think it's either party's fault for the drift. It's just a natural thing that's going to happen as you gravitate towards the people that are maybe more passionate about the things that you're passionate about. So yeah, it is kind of an interesting thing too, almost from a persuasion standpoint, which I don't generally like because it feels manipulative but if you do want to affirm a friend or let's say you want to strengthen a friendship it's it almost seems like what you need to do is affirm their identity and if you're constantly tearing that identity down or disagreeing with that identity or worse kind of making a person feel crazy or wrong for their identity you're probably not really doing much for that friendship and that friendship's probably gonna go away eventually. So what do you think the ENFPs get out of you? Because this is a two-way street. Um, I think in general it's almost something completely different. I don't think that they are maybe attracted to authenticity (laughs) in me. I think it's almost a more rational approach to things like a, they're like you're like grounded in reality. <clears throat> they might not yeah. be. And I think uh, I think at least for ENFPs that I have maintained good friendships with, it's like they live in the clouds and they have all of these ideas and inspirations and dreams they want to follow. And I can kind of pull out from their hat the ones that might actually work and create more concrete plans with them for those dreams. Um, and then we kind of work together in that way. Anyway, guys hope you enjoyed that video. It was just a topic we were discussing and I thought maybe it would be fun to record it. If you have any questions or comments, you can leave us a comment. I also have audio questions and there's a link in the description of the YouTube video. I realize I've been really bad with getting back to my audio question. So if you've left an audio question, I apologize. I probably haven't got back to it or responded to it. Um, But it is something I like to do now and then is open up my audio questions and see what kind of questions people have left. So anyway, um, hope you have a good day. See you later.